Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will discuss about clothing and fashion and how um, it can be studied as a form of popular culture. In a review article for the annual review of anthropology, Hansen talks about how we need to go beyond looking at clothing only as a material culture. Uh, people have been talking about clothing anthropologists in, in the classics as well. You know, if you remember all the ethnographies uh, you have read, uh, there is always mention of the kind of dress people wore, particularly if it is about the indigenous people. And their information about clothing is always collected under the topic material culture, as if it is just a product that people have like television, uh, like a telephone or something like that. So, what kind of dress people wear did not attract um, a very um, in-depth ethnographic analysis until very recently. Now, lately we have begun to understand that clothing is not just a form of material culture, it also has a lot of symbolic value. Um, Emma Tarlow has a um, book on uh, the evolution of dress and identity um, in India and there also we can see very clearly how discussions about clothing were intertwined with discussions about uh, a kind of national identity particularly during the um, uh, freedom uh, movement. So, um, one thing first for us to understand is there is not any such thing as a traditional clothing that remains uh, static forever. What we understand to be traditional clothing has itself arrived into that position over a long period of time. So, what is traditional today may change into something else tomorrow. So, tradition as a notion with regard to clothing particularly has to be um, explored thoroughly. Now, from clothing, how do we connect to fashion? Fashion is not a topic a lot of anthropologists want to think that this is not something that we can study with the tools we have. Uh, but um, the um, author suggests uh, that fashion is to be seen as a part of um, all the other things that have come with this phenomenon we call globalization because fashion also today travels um, between the north and the south and within the south and uh, a lot of ideas um, flow between continents and countries and therefore, fashion has to be seen not just um, within its own cultural context, but also in the larger global arena. Um, and here also we have to be a little bit careful about assuming that fashion is only flowing in one direction that is from the west uh, to other places. Um, what would be interesting for an anthropologist uh, in studying fashion would be to look at what these authors call as hybridization or creolization. What do we mean by that? What we mean is how a particular form of dress or a garment is taken from one place and then what happens to it when it uh, goes into another place. How do the people there adapt and probably remake and redesign this particular kind of fashion either in material terms in terms of what uh, textile material goes into its production or even in the terms of context where does one wear it. You know, we will discuss more in detail later in the lecture about uh, jeans, for example, as a form of uh, uh, popular culture. But I just want to say here quickly as an example, 
um, you know, once upon a time jeans was to be worn in very, uh, you know, informal context, but also uh, by people from certain class backgrounds. Today that barrier has been um, crossed and today jeans can mean many things to many people depending upon so many other factors. So one cannot draw a, a homogeneous conclusion. So therefore, we have to pay attention to this process called creolization. And another point which we have to pay attention to is the larger discourse that happens about clothing um, and fashion. Uh, in many cases, as it has happened in India during the um, uh, colonial times uh, and later uh, with what came to be important in terms of uh, supporting uh, Kadi, these discourses can tell us a lot about how people are thinking about their own identities, national, regional, gender identities, religious identities. Therefore, what people wear, where they wear it and how do they choose to wear it, in what context are certain kinds of clothing allowed and certain kinds of clothing are frowned upon, all these things have to be looked at. So the larger debate about clothing, it is not just about what people wear, it is also about what people are saying about it in public forums, um, that also is of interest. So these are the reasons why we should be focusing on fashion as much as anybody else. So who are the scholars who have looked at um, clothing and fashion? Emma Tarlow is one name I mentioned. Um, in more detail with regard to India particularly, uh, Claire Wilkinson um, has done um, a remarkable job in studying uh, fashion um, as uh, it is understood and practiced in Bollywood, but not just about fashion in Bollywood. Uh, she is also looking at how that comes out of the world of Bollywood into our everyday lives and what does that become then? What kind of object does fashion become in ordinary people's lives and what role does it play within the film world? So this is um, her work uh, which she has uh, looked at very closely in her book called Fashioning Bollywood, The Making and Meaning of Hindi Film Costume. So in that book, uh, her main points are, are um, in, and in other articles as well, what she does is to look at the relationship between um, this persona that we now call the designer and the, their predecessors, um, the, the tailors and those people in the film industry who did not call themselves uh, designers in the same sense that we understand them to be today and how they interacted and created um, a fashion which then uh, comes into the larger society. And then what this changing meaning of fashion um, represents for the films themselves. Within the film world, uh, how has fashion changed and why and what meaning does it take now? So, it seems even in the 1930s and 40s, uh, already people in India were uh, particularly women. So largely the audience that we are talking about is also women, but um, later we will look at another scholar who, who has looked at fashion with regard to masculinity. Um, but in this case, um, a lot of women used to look at um, stars like Kanan Devi and Leela Desai. So this is a 1939 and already people are talking about um, going to uh, the tailors and trying to follow the kind of saris worn by these women or the hairstyle. So fashion obviously is not only clothing, it's all there is a lot of other things also that come under fashion, but in this lecture we are looking at clothing. So one is that this interest, this connection between film world and fashion is long standing. It's been there for nearly 70, 80 years now. But 
within that, within the films, there was clear demarcation uh, between the kind of costume that can be worn by uh, what is called as a vamp character, this female villain character, this person who um, in some movies will be outright villainous. In many movies, uh, this person occupied some kind of a liminal place, so to speak. Usually, this character is um, partly in love with the um, male lead, the hero uh, is not uh, reciprocated and then takes some actions and in the end would repent. So, the Wham character in itself is a very interesting character to think about. But um, looking at clothing, if you recall uh, the kind of clothes worn by uh, film stars like Helen and Nadira in Hindi films, um, there was a particular way in which Helen would dress, uh, which would never be available uh, for the heroine, the main female actor. Uh, the main female actor will always be dressed um, in a very demure fashion, um, mostly in saris. Uh, later on, we see this person in other um, garments as well, other kinds of dresses, uh, but largely confining to the, uh, the traditional um, expected understanding of Indian womanhood. That is the kind of womanhood she personifies in the film as opposed to the vamp. Now, what does the vamp uh, then uh, designate through her clothing? One is modernity, because um, vamps were in the beginning, particularly in the 1950s and even in the 60s, um, the vamp, the women who played the roles of vamps um, are dressed in what we would consider to be at that time very modern clothing. Um, skirts, short skirts or uh, trousers and tight um, tops, uh, blouses. So, these clothing, this kind of clothing was associated with a kind of modernity which was not appreciated. And the vamp therefore, uh, along with characterization uh, through clothing as well becomes a kind of deviant figure which uh, is not to be emulated. Unlike the, the female um, heroine whose uh, clothing styles were emulated by the female viewers. So, women will go to the tailors and will tell them, you know, please make me a dress in this style as in this movie. And that uh, will not happen with, uh, say, the kind of dresses worn by Helen um, or uh, Nadira. Um, of course, there was also another character who occupies um, a similar position to the vamp in kind of a liminal way, but on the other side, uh, not in the negative side, usually in the positive side is uh, the courtesan woman, whose clothing is also very different um, from that of the vamp. So, most female viewers will go to uh, remake the dress worn by uh, the kind of saris worn by the heroines and not by these other female characters who are equally central to the film. So, heroines in saris and vamps in skirts. Now, this changes with um, 1960s and 70s when uh, what was until then known as a Punjabi suit, uh, the salwar kameez, uh, becomes more common and begins to make an appearance in films. And uh, salwar kameez is also seen as a dress worn by mostly Muslim women and Punjabi women. So, particular in certain regions of India only. And then um, through these movies, they become so common um, and now it has become so uh, standard uh, that even in parts of South India, a lot of, particularly in urban India, a lot of women will be seen wearing salwar kameez in their everyday life or chudidars. Now, salwar kameez was introduced, uh, the kind of salwar kameez that women wore in everyday life at that time in the 1960s differed significantly um, from the kind of salwar kameez that was worn in the movies uh, by these actors. 
So, if we recall movies of the 1960s like um, the ones done by Asha Parekh or uh, Sadhana or Nanda, uh, these actors um, will be seen um, uh, with uh, Shalwar Kameez which are more um, close fitting, some of them will wear a churidar. Uh, than um, uh, a shalwar and, uh, and their hairstyles also. All of these things together created a particular kind of fashion which was um, very much popular at the time and a lot of women will then go to the tailors, uh, their local tailors and say make me a dress like that worn by sadhana in such and such film. So, um, fashion in the larger society was obviously driven by movies, but it starts changing. So, from saris it moves to shalwar kameez um, or churidars. And then in the mid late 1970s, we have actors like uh, Parveen Babi and uh, Zenat Aman who, um, who symbolize a particular kind of modernity which is very different from that kind of modernity that was associated with vamp um, characters previously. So, what kind of modernity are these actors bringing? Um, it is some kind of um, cosmopolitan western, clearly western um, uh, kind of clothing which does not have the association of um, uh, decadence uh, that the previous uh, vamp uh, characters were associated with. So, um, again if we recollect movies that were popular in the 1970s by Parveen Babi and Zina Taman, uh, they would wear um, regular uh, trousers and tops and evening gowns and shorts and hats uh, which were uh, popular in the west as well. So, their western costumes are not something that these um, uh, designers have to come up with or create. Um, in, in Claire Wilkinson's research, uh, we see interviews with those people who were designers between the 60s to 80s and they talk about how they had to imagine they had to be creative, they had to come up with these costumes because they never went abroad, they did not see what people wore in US or UK. They had to just watch, maybe they watched English uh, films that were released in India and concocted some kind of um, a, a costume which then becomes uh, associated with the West. Uh, uh, but when Zina Taman and Parveen Babi wear, they are wearing clothes which are common in the West and people associate it with the West without any of the negative attributes um, to those um, clothing. So, slowly what we see is what was worn by this character called the vamp is now being worn by the character called the heroine and has become more acceptable to the general public. Um, then uh, by the 90s of course, when we have movies like Kuch Kuch Hota Hai and uh, um, Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Hum, we see that uh, it is very common to see the heroines in um, western clothing and that does not um, cause any great uh, debate. However, what is uh, to be noted here is the change uh, in their clothing as the character trajectory changes. So, in Kuch Kuch Hata Hai Kajol starts with wearing um, uh, western clothes in the beginning, you know she is some kind of a tomboy in that film to begin with and then as she nears um, uh, marriage with the main hero, suddenly we start seeing Kajol wearing more and more saris. Um, so, even though western clothing becomes uh, acceptable uh, let us say uh, from the time of Parveen Babi and Zina Taman, um, what the movie still did was to clothe the heroine in, um, in saris. 
the good Indian woman, uh, particularly if she is married or she is about to get married, um, so that the norms are uh, reinforced rather than uh, challenged. So, while uh, wearing western clothing did not make uh, Kajol's character in Kuch Kuch Hota Hai bad, uh, it certainly demanded that she wear saris when she is about to be married. So, this change in films through the years also tells us something. Um, some uh, saris are easier to, co to copy as they would say in terms of a um, lot of uh, female audience watching these saris and then going out and then trying to have a sari fashioned in that way or a particular salwar or churidar. But one particular uh, dress from a film almost uh, was a rage in the country and that was Madhuri Dikshit's um, a sari uh, from the song Didi Tera Devar Divana in the film Hum Aapke Hai Kaun. Um, in the mid 1990s, the movie was a rage, the song was a rage and that sari was a rage. So, women went to their tailors and said, make me a sari like that get me that material, get me that embroidery, I want to look like that um, the way Madhuri Dikshit looked in the film. It became a huge fashion trend and that also uh, happens with the movies from then onwards. So, here what happens is they also, women also just don't want to copy uh, it exactly because it has to fit with um, their vision of what proper clothing is. Um, so, who are the intermediaries here? The tailors. The, what is very interesting about Claire Wilkinson's study and the richness of following anthropological method in studying popular culture is that we now, we now start paying attention to people who we did not think mattered at all in the uh, understanding of fashion and clothing these local tailors um, who then uh, will tell you, you know, why do not you do this? We can do it this way so that that sari worn by Madhuri in that film will look good on you, but if it is done this way. So, there are two things going on here. One is that the tailor acts as the intermediary uh, between the fashion that is exhibited in the film by the actor and the local clientele who want that, but in their own way. And the second point is that women do not just copy or emulate, but they also select, adapt and negotiate to Claire, quote Claire Wilkinson. So, what they do is they select what they want from that dress which was worn by Madhuri Dikshit and then they adapt and change it to um, their circumstances and uh, while it st will still look like the sari that was worn by Madhuri Dikshit, it will not be an exact copy. It will be what they want ultimately. So, very interesting phenomena going on here. Um, and when it comes to designers themselves, a lot of designers uh, were women in the past, particularly starting with uh, Guru Dutt Pyasa in 1957. We've had a lot of uh, female designers working very closely with these actors um, like Helen. So, there is a uh, uh, in, um, incident mentioned in the uh, article where this one actor who had to dress up Helen in a particular costume had to come up with some kind of feathery costume because she thought that is what uh, she was told that that is what cabaret uh, dancers do and uh, she goes to you know markets and gets chicken feathers and then um, sticks them onto the dress. It is very interesting to think about what kind of thing people engage in, in order to create this persona that we see on screen. Of course, the other difference between designers then and designers now is that in those days these uh, designers, largely women, did not have their own retail um, business, they did not have their own line. Now, we know um, that a lot of these designers have their own line. Um, so, you know Manish Malhotra, Savya Sachi Mukherjee, these names are familiar to middle class and upper middle class people because they have their own line and 
there is a very close relationship with what the stars wear, the film stars wear and um, uh, the kind of um, retailing these designers do. So they both feed upon each other quite a lot. Um, but again, even with the designers that are now very active, there is always care taken to dress the uh, female lead in modern but not in a very threatening manner. So the female lead will look cosmopolitan, fashionable, um, worthy of being emulated by a lot of people, but she will still not be very threatening. Threatening kind of behavior is not appreciated, um, as we will see later, um, as well in another example. What has also changed between the sari becoming shalwar kameez and then the western clothes is also that what is supposed to be a filmy look has changed. So in the past, a particular kind of dress will denote a uh, very filmy kind of appearance. People will say, oh, you look very filmy in that dress. But this changes with movies like Dil Chata Hai where uh, the protagonists are dressed just like young people in their everyday lives, you know, in a t-shirt and jeans, um, nothing um, very particularly uh, filmy about it. They may have brands that become popular later on, but this kind of a look is called super realism look. So the, the film world starts asking not for extravagance but for realistic but something super. So super realistic kind of look is what is appreciated um, in uh, films later on. So what are the main points of discussion here? Uh, fashion today uh, denotes more about wearability for the designers in the movies. So they, while they want to dress for the stars, they also want their costumes, uh, their line to be available to the general public um, for them to be able to wear as well. And here there is a difference between various designers. Some are targeting only the rich and elite, while the others are targeting um, college going audience. But uh, wearability as a factor becomes more important. Um, who has gone out of the picture here? The local tailor. Because now um, dresses are mass produced and available in malls and in um, other stores. So going to the tailor and getting this particular dress done, um, just like how that star dressed in a particular movie, that is kind of becoming rarer now. It is possible that people are still going to tailors uh, to ask for um, dresses uh, which are worn by uh, television um, actors because television actors also pay a lot of attention to jewelry. Um, but uh, the, the relationship and the status that the tailor occupied say 20, 30 years ago uh, is not there anymore. Uh, the other point also is about creativity. So there is a lot of intersection here uh, between globalization and uh, the kinds of fashion trends that are happening. So before globalization, particularly say before 1991 when the economy was liberalized, the, the designers that were working in the film industry at that point had to do a lot of uh, creative thinking, imagination, uh, to um, and have a lot of conversations with the directors and the actors to come up with this persona whose dress is then emulated by everybody else. Now with um, uh, all top global brands available in India and uh, uh, fans uh, of these uh, film stars being able to buy them off the shops. Um, how much creativity is really required is uh, a question that some of the designers uh, who had been working in the film industry in the 60s and 70s raised with um, the author. So that is a question that we want to think about. Now uh, let me just go back to one of the most popular um, clothing uh, 
um, I mentioned earlier, which is jeans. So jeans, we know blue jeans, everybody is wearing them almost uh, everywhere in all parts of the world. How did this come to be? So we have two scholars uh, who talk about it in great detail, John Fisk and uh, Daniel Miller. Both of them talk about genes and what it signifies and John Fisk talks about it in, in a larger theoretical exercise where he says that we should pay attention to how a particular kind of dress which was associated with um, working class men maybe or um, the, we the wild west of United States, the cowboys. How did that become um, such a commonplace um, form of dress? Um, how did this happen? He also talks about um, how uh, jeans is not just about a kind of dress, but it also carries a lot of symbolic value. Now, what kind of values does jeans carry? Jeans, wearing jeans is also about one's interaction or interface with what is known as Americanization. So, uh, you know, it is clearly associated with United States and therefore to wear jeans is to express some kind of relationship, highly contested and complicated nevertheless, but some kind of relationship with this um, uh, American uh, notion of uh, masculinity as well. Why is jeans popular? Easy to maintain. The more you wash, the better it becomes. And slowly what people started doing is actually uh, using it over a long period of time. It's a sturdy garment. It's rather sturdy and it doesn't wear out so quickly. So people tended to use it for a long time. Uh, when after a few washes, it starts fading. Fisk points out here that eventually the manufacturers of jeans started looking at what people were doing and then started manufacturing that um, in their factories. So in a very interesting way here, fashion is coming not from some top designer sitting in some studio in New York, but fashion is coming from the people who are wearing it who then tell the manufacturers, this is the way in which we would like to use this particular kind of clothing. And then the manufacturers respond by saying, okay, we will give that to you. So what we start getting later on are faded jeans, uh, torn jeans, uh, wrapped jeans as they are called. So in some sense, um, it's a very interesting um, interaction that's going on here between the ones who are producing the clothing and the ones who are consuming it. In some sense, Fisk is arguing that the consumers have a lot of agency even though the manufacturers are the dominant uh, force here. Another reason why people wear jeans is because they don't want to distinguish themselves. Everyone wants to look like everybody else. But how do we account for that then in the West particularly where we are um, uh, told that there is more individualism? And what does it say then that in countries like India where the individual is not, uh, is always subservient to the collective that more and more people are wearing jeans. Does it indicate that we are becoming more and more individualistic? Can we associate um, directly uh, genes and individualism? Um, what's going on here? So that is um, another um, question as well. Um, so what becomes a sort of a garment which is associated with everyone? slowly we start getting designer jeans and it becomes more upscale. So the fit is different, the material is different, uh, the design is different and slowly and slowly while everyone is wearing jeans, some people are wearing certain labels which still have some symbolic value. These are seen as upscale, upmarket, expensive 
jeans. So we could be wearing jeans and all the top film stars can also be wearing jeans, but the jeans that they wear will be very different from the jeans that most ordinary people wear. So this differentiation also starts happening. In Danny Miller's work, uh, where he has a he had a project called the Global Denim uh, Project, available online, um, uh, what he found in his field work in London was that a lot of people, particularly migrants to London um, from countries like Brazil, for example, once they move to London, they start wearing more jeans as well because they feel that that way they will not be, uh, they will not stand out from the uh, locals or the natives. Um, so the association that genes has with uh, the sort of the uh, young rebel kind of persona or a form of resistance or historically it was also associated with uh, um, sort of uh, problem making characters. Um, all these uh, associations that genes has does not necessarily resonate with the migrant. For the migrant, this is a kind of garment that is worn by locals and therefore um, far easier for them to blend into the society. It, it establishes some kind of equality for them which otherwise is um, not easily available for migrants in their initial years. Um, so uh, genes again here is taking on different meaning. In a similar vein, more recently Constantine Nakasis has um, looked at uh, fashion and clothing among young men in Tamil Nadu in his book called Doing Style, Youth and Mass Mediation in South India. And uh, he uh, conducted field work in uh, Chennai and Madurai uh, in colleges and hostels. So basically he stayed in hostels um, um, doing participant observation and uh, um, just hanging out with the young men. And uh, while he focuses on youth as, a, as an analytical category, he is very careful uh, to pay attention to differences of caste and class um, in Tamil Nadu. And uh, uh, he argues that young people want to dress in a way that does not make them look like adults. So part of the reason they would wear jeans, let us say, is because as men get older, they do not wear jeans. They wear um, the dhoti or they wear um, formal trousers. So if you are a young person in Tamil Nadu, you want to distinguish yourself from those who are older than you and those who are younger to you by wearing jeans. And a lot of prestige is associated with uh, um, clothing. So he started hearing this word style all the time, you know. Uh, him, he was amazed that in a hot climate of Tamil Nadu, young men would wear sneakers uh, or even jeans, which is not a very comfortable garment to wear in humid climate. Um, and he often was told because this is in style, because it is about style. When they dress, the young men are not just trying to um, dress uh, for the sake of it, they are also trying to make a statement. Um, so sometimes he found men wearing uh, t-shirts with all kinds of um, uh, words and letters that did not make any sense, that were, uh, uh, that were in the wrong spelling or grammatically incorrect. Um, um, you know, why all of these things made him uh, really curious, but the answer he was getting again and again was about style. And it became very important for these young men to be able to convey that through their um, clothing. Um, so another point that men told him was about speaking in English, um, you know. So uh, showing some knowledge of English is style. Showing too much English is not style, that is showing off. So that will not be appreciated. 
So amongst young men in their peer groups, there were all these kind of tensions which everyone was trying to uh, figure out. Uh, Nakasis also looks at counterfeit clothing you know, clothing by big brands, uh, labels that are then uh, copied and uh, sold uh, in large numbers. And uh, one of the things he found uh, with these uh, young men who are wearing them was that uh, actually nobody pays attention to the brand names as such, but wearing a brand name um, even if it is spelt wrong because it is not the real brand is making a point. So, they wanted to wear let us say Benetton but they can't afford Benetton or they do not want to. One of his informants says why should I spend so much money on one dress when I can get three for the same price. So, then what they do is then they get clothes which carry um, Benetton spelt um, in a wrong way because it is not, um, there is no copyright uh, for these people to produce the garment. But it is, people will still notice that and that in itself um, is um, performing masculinity there. It is performing not just masculinity, it is also performing uh, youth through the style. It is performing their age performing their liminal position in the hierarchy within the society, it is also performing their gender. So, the, the men were very conscious about what they were doing, but they were doing it in all these confusing and interesting ways which only an ethnographic study will bring out. So, there are these notions about what can be worn who should wear it. So, there is a lot of reference to the movies obviously. So, if we look at old Tamil films 50s, 60s, we will not find jeans. Men wear trousers, but the trousers also change uh, as we go into the 1970s where we start uh, seeing more of what is known as bell bottom uh, trousers. Um, so, there are movies uh, like the one that came out in 2008 called Subramanyapuram which references to fashion in the 1970s. So, these uh, trends are, um, are uh, recalled for that effect that this is how we dressed in the 1970s, this is not how we dress anymore. And of course, as we come closer to the 90s and after, jeans starts making more of an appearance. Um, so, there is a clear sense of uh, there is a lot of attention being paid to look, being paid to beauty um, and uh, what we see in Nakas's work is uh, that it affects men as much as it affects women. Uh, in another work on uh, the Miss India beauty pageants by anthropologist Susan Runkel, what we see is also how this notion of this beautiful Indian woman is conjured up. Um, so, what she does is she follows the, the group of women who undergo training for the Miss India competition um, and they are all put up in a hotel in one place and there is a very strict uh, regimen um, that they have to follow, very strict schedule. And in that schedule, they have to look at uh, these, um, um, uh, they have to look at, uh, pay attention to accent, to the way they speak, the way they eat. So, there are all these uh, chaperones who are watching them. Um, it is almost like being in some kind of an institution um, where there is a panopticon. Um, in fact, Runkel uh, talks about her approach as Foucauldian in that sense. So, what is going on here? These women are being trained to appear for this Miss India competition through attention to food, um, their dress, uh, fitness. So, they have to lose weight if they are considered to be not up to the mark. They have to lose weight through very strict diet um, and undergo training to be able to appear in front of television cameras and talk to people and speak with confidence in the um, pageants themselves. Because the women who then go on to the Miss India pageant 
you know, if they win, um, then they will go on further uh, to Miss World or Miss Universe and Miss Asia Pacific. So, those things matter a lot. So, this became very particular, especially after Aishwarya Rai and Shushmita Sen win uh, Miss Universe and Miss World in 1994. So, after that, um, there is huge attention, there is a beauty industry that I almost um, comes up and part of this Miss India exercise is that actually. But here also, very similar to uh, what we found in Claire Wilkinson's work, while these women are trained to answer questions with confidence, so um, that they are able to do well in these uh, finals, they are not, um, they, they are told not to be very aggressive in their response. So, confidence is appreciated, arrogance and aggression is not appreciated. Um, but why do they even join? Uh, one would wonder if one reads that piece, why do women go through so much trouble? What is in it? Why, are, why do people even care about Miss India, uh, Miss um, uh, whatever? Um, it turns out that a lot of these women see participation in this competition as a stepping stone to their careers in modeling or in fashion design or um, in films. Both Aishwarya Rai and Shushmita Sen entered the film industry um, and, uh, and many other models have done that afterwards. So, this is seen as just a step towards that. They know that at the end of the day there will only be one person who will be Miss India. But still, just going through this rigor helps them build networks and contacts which will be then useful for them. And more importantly, they then become the mediators of beauty and style. They are then negotiating between what um, women should wear and what will look fashionable and stylish. Yeah? So, part of the problem for the designers then is in convincing the public that this is really what they want to wear. Um, and Kuldova looks at that uh, through her work amongst fashion designers in Delhi. So, what we see in that uh, research is how these designers uh, through their shows where they put up a huge spectacle really, uh, where there is a particular theme and attention is paid to that particular cultural context. It might be Turkey, it might be Spain, it could be something else. Um, all of these things are taken care of and they are covered by television channels and a lot of film stars and, and uh, other elite come to attend these shows. And through this, the designers then go on to um, convince uh, the, la, the, the clientele that this is what is fashionable at the moment. You know, it is either a peacock design or indigo or some such. Um, but, so, we see in the press and in, on television, you know, this summer collection, winter collection. So, all these things um, are then uh, discussed and debated and displayed in these um, gatherings. So, also what uh, becomes more um, uh, commonly heard in these kind of discussions is also about uh, the greatness of Indian textiles or Indian textile heritage and how a particular material can be used this way. So, what happens also is now um, increasingly the designers are beginning to pay more attention to their Indian clientele using Indian motives and Indian concepts and Indian themes, um, but also still um, harking um, or arguing for sort of a global presence as well um, in just the last 40 years since this um, industry has come up. So, uh, the nation is constantly invoked. So, while fashion 
a show itself might be seen as something uh, which has come from the West, what happens uh, in the show and how it is curated is um, very indicative of a particular imagination of what is Indian and how should Indian fashion scene uh, look like, what should it look like. So what do we learn from all these um, studies on fashion as a form of popular culture? One is that anthropological methods allow us to pay attention to all small um, um, actors and or behind the scene actors and invisible uh, happenings that go on in making this possible. Um, so we see that tailors played a very crucial role in the past in translating fashion from the film world to everyday life. But what questions also then emerge which scholars pay attention to is what kind of fashion is being um, appropriated? What does it become um, once it uh, is appropriated and uh, goes into the uh, hands of designers and then the public? Um, and who is appropriating what? You know, what are the um, um, hierarchies through which these appropriations have to be negotiated? Um, what we also learn is about the ideas about beauty um, and body, you know, the kind of the, uh, the kind of Indian beauty that one should uh, look for or what is defined as Indian understanding of beauty. We also get a sense about the amount of labor that is involved in creative industries like fashion, um, you know, and who are the players across the chain um, in producing fashion. Uh, and lastly, we also understand um, fashion as a world in which globalization processes play themselves out. Thank you.